It's okay. Okay, so everybody, let's give a warm startup guy and welcome for Mitteluge from Hindamandu. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mitteluge, for, for coming here today. Um, yeah, we are, yeah, we are we're just thrilled to have you here. We've been hunting you for quite a while, so now we finally <laughs> succeeded in getting you here. Sorry so. about that. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Um, yeah, well, I mean, uh, you've been doing a lot of different different stuff as well as our other speakers, but uh, but from a quite different angle uh, 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 compared to many of the others, at least uh, some of the some of the road, I think. Um, but what what I usually do and what I want to do here today as well is also to try to start all the way from the beginning. Uh, so talk a little bit about uh, where where did you grow up? Um, I I grew up in uh, in Ringkøbing, which is on the very very western uh, part of in the very western part of Denmark. It's very very windy every day. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind so of rough. <laughs> cool. So are there many startups over there? Vestas, mm. for one, mm. Mm. <laughs> naturally, no, yeah. uh, but that was a, a while ago. But uh, but otherwise, I would say no, not really. Okay, okay. So, so was it always in the cars that you would kind of, uh, uh, <laughs> so you came from, from Rinkrieb and go to Copenhagen and then start uh, the, one of the biggest Danish app successes so far? Um, well, I, I think in, in one sense, it was kind of in the cars that I would start something up. My family is... Uh, uh, have their own company and, and my grandfather started that company in 1947 and my dad then he's been running it for I don't know 40 years now and my brother is taking over as a, a CEO now so it's I've kind of grown up with uh, grown up with people uh, that are just really passionate about what they do and uh, and it's you know with work being a lifestyle and I just thought that was a great way to live a bit hard at times, but also very fulfilling when, when things succeed. Yeah, of course. What did your grand granddad's company do? Oh, uh, it's like a very well uh, small scale Home Depot okay. uh, in uh, in Jutland, hmm. uh, and actually they just started a branch in Copenhagen as well. Ten okay. four, it's called. Okay, ten four. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm not proud of that. <laughs> that's what it's called. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. So so when did you so so from Ringkøbing where did you go next? Um, you you studied in uh, at Aarhus I think. If I remember yeah correctly. yeah I, I studied uh, political science in Aarhus mm. uh, for five and a half years and then uh, while I was studying I worked at the uh, Jyllandsposten mm -hmm. Danish newspaper as a researcher and journalist and then um, immediately after finishing I I moved to Copenhagen to to work with McKinsey as, as a management consultant. Um, and ba basically, uh, I, I was not educated for that at all <laughs> <laughs> with political science, but I just knew quite early on that I did not want to work with political science. Uh, I did not want to work in the public sector, <laughs> for sure, like all my other, uh, all my friends did. So I had to find some stepping stone to, to getting into the private sector, and McKinsey was quite, is qu uh, pretty good. Uh, place for that. Okay, cool, cool. Yeah, we're getting to that. Uh, I, uh, you also studied uh, at Luton, right? Journalism, is, is that right? Or uh, I think I saw the LinkedIn profile. Or what? <laughs> I, well, that was like a summer school for three weeks and mostly, ah, okay. <laughs> mostly hanging out at night. So I, I don't think I, I wouldn't okay. call that studying. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Okay. Uh, how about hobbies growing up? Did you have any crazy hobbies that you want to talk about? Uh, or? Oh, non crazy. That's uh, okay. No crazy ones. I think I was uh, very much into horseback riding mm -hmm. from I was, uh, I think, eight or nine, and then for around ten years I was competitive. And it's it's a special sport in the sense that it it takes a lot of time. Uh, not only is it quite expensive, but it takes two or three hours every day, seven days a week. So it is c a, a pretty big responsibility at that age to to have your own horse. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I could imagine. I also re read somewhere that you started a, a club magazine at the club, or, or was that kind of your first uh, business or what? Yeah, I, I w I've always been very fascinated by journalism, and, uh, and I thought it was a shame there were so many interesting things going on at this local club, and no one really communicated it, so I started this magazine. Where I would uh, I was the journalist and the photographer and the postman and the printer printing girl and I, I did everything <laughs> myself. Oh, cool, okay. I think I was 12 at that time, so it was a 
it was a great, uh, great training for what was to come with Endomondo, I would say. Okay, <laughs> nice, nice. Um, okay, I also, uh, when I Googled you, I, I got quite a few of the Google's pages back and I found uh, Medelugo.com where you also uh, show some paintings that you do. Or is that something you is do that still? still or what? Alive? Yeah, yeah. I found it, but it was like five pages back. Thanks so. for mentioning that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I used to paint quite a bit, okay. um, and then when I uh, uh, by the then a couple of years ago, I got when I got pregnant with my daughter. I, you know, you're not supposed to paint for a while, and then I just put it all away, and I never really, never really had it out since then. So. No. Yeah. That's one thing I would like to to take up again at some point, but uh, probably not anytime soon. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think you should you should go check it out. I mean, there's really good no, stuff in there. You I really think. shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think it's pretty good. Okay. All right. But <laughs> um, okay. So 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 you you mentioned you work as a researcher for for for. For a person, was that kind of like the, the natural step up from your horseback club magazine, and then yeah, okay. yeah, I think I always had two, uh, two different paths uh, I could take. So one was journalism, and the other one was more hardcore business. Mm -hmm. And I just tried both of them a little bit at at, uh, at separate times or different times. Uh, but uh, but the job at Ulands person was really. I thought it was the most amazing student job you could have. I mean, if you study in Aarhus, you don't have as many options as when you study in Copenhagen. But at, at that paper, I was the only one doing research. So because of that, I would get invited to these editorial meetings every morning. At 9.30, we would sit down so with the editor-in-chief and you know all the top people for each department and talk about what, what's going to be in tomorrow's newspaper. It was just amazing. I think I was like 22 or 23 at that time, <laughs> just <laughs> sitting at that table and just, you know, seeing things in print the next day was just mind blowing. Um, and also just contributing and, you know, first time you see your name on a front page is uh, it's quite <laughs> something. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, cool. So, 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 you seem to talk very, very passionate about journalism. I mean, why, why aren't you a journalist today? You think? Um, because you don't build anything. You just, you know, if you're lucky, you get to cover what other people build. And mm -hmm. I just really wanted to be, be con contribute more, I think, and just really start something and follow it. Plus, you're kind of a slave of this news, news day, and you know, you have these 24 hours, and everything goes at a, at a certain pace, and it gets faster and faster, and you don't really get to the bottom of every of anything. Okay. More or less, only very few journalists do now. So, I just thought it was, it would be better to, to actually make a real difference, <laughs> not just cover what other <laughs> people did. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yes, yeah, sorry, uh, I lost my track. Um, uh, yeah, so so okay, now I know what it was. <laughs> uh, so uh, from from from, so, so from journalism, and I would say. That one of the reasons why you didn't want to uh, 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 be a journalist was because you didn't create anything. So why did you then take it to political science? Good question. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I don't know. <laughs> well, I think I think there is mainly one reason, and it's pretty lame. But uh, my uh, the the teacher I had in that in gymnasium on high school was my favorite teacher mm -hmm. by far, and I just thought. Uh, yeah, I, he made it interesting. So I, I continued at university, and they didn't necessarily make it interesting, but I just, you know, wanted to get it over with. But in hindsight, I probably should have gone to business school instead. <laughs> okay, okay. So, so what happened from, from, from your Master of Political Science? Where, where did you go next from there? Um, so from there, I, I, I started at McKinsey, which is where I met uh, Christian uh, Birk and Jakob Jung, who are also who are my co-founders at, at Endomondo. So that's where we really met. Mm -hmm. um, we all started out there on the same day. They have these batches of new people or new hires. So we we went we got to go on this trip to Prague uh, together and did all the initial courses together. And then I think a year and a half into it, we started talking about how much fun it could be if we had our own company instead and 
if we were our own bosses and didn't have the partners to report to all the time <laughs> and didn't have to travel all the time and didn't have to work quite as much or at least when we did work we could decide what tasks uh, to work on okay. um, yeah also when you when you work as a consultant you kind of you go in and you identify the problem and you tell people what to do and then you leave and it's not very fulfilling because you don't actually get to see if they succeed with it or not. Um, and we just wanted to really follow the process and follow it through all the way. Very right, cool. So, so looking back in hindsight, I mean, what was the difference between being a consultant in McKinsey and being an entrepreneur in Edmond? Can you even compare the two or? Uh, not really. It's, it was really, uh, it was a big change because we, we came from, uh, we came from these jobs where I think work-wise or, or like lifestyle-wise, it was more or less the same number of hours, but we didn't have much flexibility as consultants. Um, and you, we had all the we had all these fancy suits and nice business cards. And whenever we called someone and said, you know, I'm calling from McKenzie, I need this data, people would be okay. Like I'll I'll go f I'll go get it. And then when we started with Endomondo, it was like I'm calling from Endomondo, and it was like. Oh, that travel side? No, <laughs> not, not, not really. Not Mo Mondo. Endo Mondo. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Det kan vi. Jeg ved ikke om vi har andre mikrofoner. No, ja, det bliver måske lidt besværligt. Skal jeg så ikke bare tale højt? Tror det er okay? This is like an IQ test. I'm failing. <laughs> but what is this one here? Oh. Is this okay? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, perfect. Okay. Uh, yeah, all right. So, so where were we? Uh, oh, yeah, consultancy versus entrepreneurship. Um, so, um, um, Yeah, so at what point at McKinsey did you kind of like realize that, okay, this life is not for me, I want to do something else? What, what, what made you realize that? Um, I, think, I think after, well, you, you learn a lot, especially in the beginning. The learning curve is very steep and it's very interesting and the energy there is really good. I've, I've never experienced a, a can-do attitude like that. It's really amazing and the people are great and very bright um, but I just uh, I think around a little more than a year in probably I I knew that I definitely wa wasn't gonna go for the partner track even if I could so uh, yeah it, it didn't take that long. It's also about the values I think for me it's important that um, both that you have fun at work not all the time but quite often <laughs> at least at least daily you have you know fun times uh, and and also that it it actually makes a real difference i think mckinsey has a lot of impact but it's very uh, it's very financial it's you know it's the bottom line of very big corporations and that's fine and i respect that but it's just not what really uh, excites me the most yeah, okay, that makes a lot of sense, I think. <laughs> I think most people here will understand yeah. that. <laughs> but, but you won an award, right, or something like that, so you apparently you were pretty good at it. Uh, and I'm, oh, no, that was for my, that was for my uh, time at university. Ah, okay, okay. Yeah, okay, yeah they, okay. they pass out these awards when they want to recruit people, so they ah, flatter ah. you a little bit, and then they <laughs> <laughs> give you a contract. <laughs> okay, okay. It works quite well, okay. actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. okay. okay, nice. Um, so... Okay, so let, let's start talking a little bit about startups. Uh, I, I guess that's also a pretty big part of your life now. Um, uh, the way I understood it from a couple of interviews was that you got into startups uh, because you met a gypsy in New York. Is that right? <laughs> uh, the reporters like to say that. <laughs> uh, well, I, while I was at McKinsey, I, I, I knew I was going to move on. And Christian, Jacob and I had this had the, all these talks about starting something and it wasn't specific at all. We, had, we actually had 10 different ideas that we were discussing. Uh, and the overall idea was to be this house of entrepreneurship where we would initiate the idea or like conceptualize 
uh, the new businesses and then start them out and then pass them on. I was super naive because things just take a lot of time. But, but that was on the one hand and then on the other hand, uh, I, had a, I had a client that uh, I really, really liked and that I would like to work for and I had an offer from them. And at the same time, Christian and Jacob and I had that other talk. So I just, it was just within a few days, I basically just had to make that decision. And then on the same, on the very day that I had to let that client know, I met this, I was at a, I was working in New York at that time, and I met this gypsy lady on the street. I was just walking from the hotel to the office, and she, she just ran over to me, gave me a postcard, and then she took off. And I was like, that was weird. And then on the postcard it said, um, whatever our wildest dreams may be, they only scratch the surface of what's possible. And that kind of spoke to the whole fear I had about that insecurity and you know starting up and the adventure, but what if it doesn't play out well and all that stuff. So it's kind of kind of like a sign, even though I'm quite rational. I did think that was a bit weird. <laughs> okay, cool. So so when did you start in Domandu? Uh seven years ago, uh this November. So right, two thousand seven. So okay, cool. So we only oh, seven years old. Impressive. Um, so, so I think I heard some something about. I never really managed to find it anyway. But, but so, so, so if, it's, if it's not true, then let's just move on. But I heard something about that that you and your co-founder sat down and you made a graph about uh, what would be the most fun thing to thing to do versus the hardest uh, uh, thing to do, and, and then you ended up with it. And do. Can you talk about that process if it's even true? Yeah. Well, yeah. That was that was when we had those ten different ideas, uh, and I don't even remember. I think barely any of the others, but we, we just had this very consultant, uh, consultancy approach where we had this whole matrix for the different parameters and we scored them on different, you know. And then at the end of it, it was like, so what do we actually feel like doing? <laughs> I was like, it's, okay, scrap that exercise. Well, let's just do what we feel most passionate about. And the three of us all had uh, different backgrounds in, in sports. So running and skiing and horseback riding. So it was natural to to kind of uh, unite that in Endomondo. Okay. Can you talk a little bit about the uh, the space back then? I mean, was it bleeding obvious to make a fitness uh, app based on GPS? Uh, no. <laughs> this was uh, this was before uh, any app stores, and it was also before uh, before the iPhone, I think. Um, so before any phones more or less had GPS, only a few Nokia models had. So the whole notion of apps was very new, and when, when you know when we first launched our version, I think you almost had to be an engineer to figure out how to get it on your phone. It involved a text message and downloading something to somewhere and finding it again. And it was really, it was quite a hassle. Uh, so it it we were certain, we were among the first ones uh, to do this, uh, but it turned out later that. There were quite a few teams around the world that had some of the same thinking, at least uh, at the same time, without knowing about each other for years. You know, it, we all grew at a certain pace, so it took years for us to even realize that we weren't alone. Okay, so I'm guessing that it must be very hard to find any test customers that wanted to try. I mean, how how did you really really develop it? I mean, uh, yeah, we had to we had to buy them phones, <laughs> so it's <was> pretty expensive. <laughs> um, but we, we bought a lot of phones and gave them to friends and people we knew uh, just so they could uh, use the GPS functionality and, and test it out. Uh, we also uh, we had a great cooperation back then with uh, Sparta, uh, a big uh, running club in Copenhagen. So their pacekeepers would, uh, would run with these phones every Sunday when they, did a, they, had this, they have this training with a thousand people participating. So that was great marketing. Okay, cool. I, I tried to browse, uh, I found you on Intermonitor.com and then I tried to browse all the way back to see when was the first time you used it and that was apparently April uh, 30, 2008. Was this the time when you launched or? or, uh, or we, in April, you said? Yeah, yeah, we, we yeah launched, April 2008. Yeah, yeah. we launched in uh, August 2008, mm. so, that, okay, that, so have, that was some early testing, <laughs> I think. Yeah, yeah okay, okay. <laughs> Yeah, because I mean, I also noticed that it was a big gap from April 2000 to uh, uh, April 30, 2008, and then until 
until August 20, where you suddenly have a lot of them. And yeah. also in that period, what also happened was that I guess that was when the Lehman Brothers and everything came yeah. crashing down. I mean, what, what were you guys feeling like? You were just about to, on the verge of yeah. launching something and then all this stuff Well, we, we had just launched and then two, two weeks later, Lehman Brothers collapsed. And this was just the week we were going to go knocking on uh, VCE doors. <laughs> so uh, not the most ideal timing, I would say. But um, yeah, but it, it turned out quite nicely in the sense that we became very uh, cost conscious from the beginning. Okay. Um, well, and we had to because none, none of us had anything up front that we could invest, uh, except, you know, what the stuff you have to put up front. <laughs> uh, and so we, uh, we didn't really get, uh, we, didn't, we had a hard time finding investors. Um, and we had, I remember the, the first very uh, heated discussion we had, the three of us, because we'd never worked together at McKinsey. We had no idea if we could work together. But the first very heated discussion we had was around uh, our paychecks when we started uh, paying out salary. Uh, and we were, it was very heated because some won 40,000 a month and some won 20 or 25. And it was just a very hypothetical <laughs> discussion because it took 18 months to to get less <laughs> to get less than that <laughs> so uh, yeah it was it was a bit tough in the beginning um, all the basically all the vcs uh, they were really good at uh, seeing all the barriers uh, i'm sure other people have had the same experience but the two main reasons why it would never succeed was that it uh, it required gps which was 3 or 4 years too early uh, and it uh, required people to actually run with the phone uh, on the arm or somewhere else, and no one would obviously do that. Uh, so those were the two main barriers, and the main reason people just said no. Um, but then we... Thank you. Well, <laughs> is it supposed to be this loud now? Okay. Better? Yeah, that's a bit better. Okay. So where were we? Uh, yeah, where were we? Oh yeah, yeah. So so we f we uh, we did the traditional thing. So we found um, uh, friends and fools as uh, as our initial investors, and then later on we got some uh, we got two professional business angels, and then we got a VC uh, on board okay. a couple of years later. Yeah. So. So one of the things that I also noticed on your Crunchbase profile is that uh, 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 seed capital seems to be there every, every, every single, single time. <laughs> do, do you really like them or what's up <laughs> that? Yeah, we've done a, a couple of rounds now with them, I think four <laughs> in total. Uh, yeah, but it, 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 uh, it works well and uh, it's, uh, yeah. We, we haven't really, uh, we haven't raised that much actually, if you think about it, uh, it's been seven years. Um, so there hasn't been much reason to to look beyond and, and look to the U.S., for example. Okay. okay. Um, uh, yeah. So right after the uh, uh, Demon Brothers crashed, I guess that that you must have been getting a lot of rejections and stuff. But also wrote somewhere you uh, or read somewhere, sorry, that you get energy from from rejections. I mean, how how are you able to do that? And how does that work? I want to have that. <laughs> uh, well, I think that was something, I think for that it's uh, a big advantage to be more than just yourself. Uh, we, there were three of us, so every time someone rejected us, it, it didn't take many seconds to convince ourselves that they were either idiots or assholes or both, and we were certainly going to make it and they would regret this someday <laughs> and just wait and see and, <laughs> you know, we would have this whole pep talk going. And then at some point it just becomes a habit, so... Now, now I do it fine solo. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. okay, that's cool. So, so you, you you stayed in Copenhagen, but you had a short stint in uh, in, in San Francisco, uh, yeah. um, but decided to go back. I mean, um, it, yeah. Why can you compare Copenhagen versus San Francisco? Some of the other places you maybe you've been uh, in terms of starting a startup. Uh, um, well, I I only lived there for three months, so it was very short period but i think uh, the main the m one main difference at least was that uh, the whole city just vibrates from startups i mean when you go to a coffee shop 
people on both sides of you will be talking about this idea they have or this startup that they're applying for. It's just uh, it's just different. And I think for for me it was extremely healthy to uh, to to come to the U.S. because we were getting more known here in Denmark. Uh, it's more than a third of the Danish population now that has registered in the community. So we were getting fairly well known here, and then when you come to the U.S., it's like no one ever heard of you, more or less. Uh, so that's a, that was a really good exercise to just uh, realize that uh, it's a big world out there and there's still a lot to do. Yeah, I could imagine. I mean, but what do you think about all this new stuff that are happening with the CBH, FTW and stuff? Is that help, helping in the Mondo or, or yeah, what do you think on that? Um, it, I don't think, it's not, it's not probably not helping us right now with the stage we're at now. Um, but I think it would have been great if there had been similar initiatives for us six, five, six, seven years ago. Definitely. Uh, and I think if I ever get involved in another startup, I'm, I'm sure it will be helpful too. Yeah. Cool. What what can we do to help in the Mondo? I mean, to be for the win. Um, well, so this this is, might sound arrogant, and it's certainly not meant <laughs> that way. But but w there aren't a lot of people in Copenhagen that have taken something from twenty five to hundred million users, and those are really the people we would like to. Uh, like uh, we would like to pick their brains a little bit, and for that we have to uh, look beyond the borders right now. Um, it's not completely, it's not entirely the truth, but but there's some truth to it. I think it's uh, we're probably a bit later stage than uh, than many of the other startups. Okay. Um, so you, uh, just one thing I want to talk about is work life balance. So I think I've read somewhere that that you and your husband work as a very nice team? I mean, how, how does that work and how has that kind of helped help in the Mondo? Um, well, I think, I think first of all, uh, Sheryl Sandberg has this uh, thing, this point that uh, if you're a woman and if you want a career, the most important decision you're ever gonna make is, uh, is your choice of partner in life because uh, it, really, it really is important that you have someone who supports you. Um, and uh, we've been together for many, many, many years now. <laughs> and uh, yeah, he, he, he knows that I, I want to achieve things and, uh, and he gives me space. And I think uh, that has been really important. Also just accepting the fact that, you know, we've had years with where I didn't make any money at all. <laughs> uh, that in itself is, can be a bit challenging. And then, of course, once you add kids to that picture, it, uh, it is a whole new dimension. Uh, and a lot of joy and a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can imagine. Okay, that's very cool. Um, so, so you won a few awards. You won the Fund of the Year 2012 Nordic Startup Awards and the McKinsey Award we talked about this was doing an <laughs> <laughs> uh, award, yeah, but it's an award. And the Female Business Owners Inspirational Award in 2013. So any other awards you're planning on winning anytime soon or? No, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> uh, but, I read, but I read somewhere that you say something along the lines of, uh, I'm not an athlete who trained my hands to the bones to get to the top. I was just focused on winning, but also on in everything else. I mean, how? Uh, Did I say that? Yeah, I think I read it in Alpha Damon, I think something like oh, that. Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> Sounds like know. something they would write. <laughs> ah, okay, 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 so okay, okay, okay. But, but you are hardworking, that, that, that's what. But but you mostly go for the win. That's, I guess, what you can draw from that. Or, yeah. But I th I well I think the a key difference between ha be having like a corporate career and, and then having your own company is the flexibility you have, and especially if you want to start a family, it it can be very very challenging if you have a corporate career and you don't have a lot of. Uh, um, power over your calendar and you have other people, you know, putting in meetings and traveling and stuff. And then as an entrepreneur, you basically decide yourself, wh you know, what, what, when you work and when you travel and, and all that. And that just really makes the whole difference. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah okay. Uh, so, 
So I just want to touch upon one of the awards, which is uh, the Female Business Owners Inspirational Awards. Uh, I know you also, I think I read somewhere, I don't really like to talk about it, but I want to touch on it anyway. You know what it is? <laughs> I, 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 I want to talk about um, mm -hmm. uh, this thing about being being a woman in a very man-dominated man world, as sort of tech startups kind of is, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, what I mean, do you have any war stories you want to share from being a female in that world? Um, <laughs> well, it's not, and I, I, I often get that question. It's not really something I, I think a lot about. And, uh, you know, you don't wake up thinking, oh, I'm a woman in a man's world. It's, you know, it's, it's uh, and it's not that bad. I think in terms of war stories, uh, there was one, uh, one or a few incidences in, um, yeah, in Barcelona, maybe some of you are familiar with the Mobile World Congress, the biggest congress within our space. Um, but we we invest, we basically more or less all the marketing money we ever spent, we spend on having a, a booth there. Uh, and we had that, I think, first time in 2010. And it really it was super expensive. And we were five or six uh, endos who went down there. And uh, and I quickly realized. Uh, that there weren't a lot of women and uh, a women and the women that I did see were oftentimes hired to hand out flyers or something. So they were basically models who were handing out the flyers, uh, and it was just uh, that whole. It just uh, affected the whole mindset there. So when people came to to an, uh, to our booth there, it was um, five of the guys and then myself, and they would look at me. And uh, just because I was a woman, they would be like, okay, but can we talk to your manager? <laughs> because we, we don't really want to talk to a woman here. I was like, okay, God damn it. And then I had these uh, signs printed. So everyone had, name was very small, and then the title was just a big <laughs> fat title, <laughs> co-founder. <laughs> so there was at least one more story. But otherwise, I think it's, uh, it's not something I really think about. Uh, we have a lot of women on our team now too, uh, but of course in the beginning when you only hire developers, it's it is gonna be male dominated. Um, I mean, I wish we would have some female supply, but we we don't really see a lot of those. Yeah, I, I, I teach a course at at DTU at Technical University of Denmark, and I think we got three females there. Uh, it's an IT course as well, so yeah, I know the the, oh. the problem. But I mean, uh, what what can we then do to get more more females in entrepreneurship? What's what is really the, the is there any problem or aren't there any problem or what do you think? Well, I think I think one message that is important to get across is that it can definitely be combined with having a family because that's probably a main concern for many. And I think it's much easier to combine than a corporate career. Um, so that's something I try to tell <laughs> women when I when I come to different events. Okay, cool. Okay, so. So I have plenty of questions, but, uh, but I only got a few that I want to ask, and then I want to pass it to the floor. Um, so what's next for you? I mean, is it just full speed ahead with Endomondo, or you got something, some other cool stuff planned? Only Endomondo. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Yeah. Do you have any cool stuff in Endomondo that you want to share with us that, that, that are happen, happening soon? Or um, yeah, sure. I mean, j we've had three kind of bigger product launches to just within the past two or three weeks, which is why it was <laughs> difficult to get this in the calendar. Uh, but, but those things are out now. So some of the things we're working on now is, uh, since we want to make it uh, more fun to exercise, um, we, we always had a strong belief in the social dimension to achieve this. Uh, we just believe that if you can interact with your friends, it is going to be more fun for all of you. Um, but I think in general, in the industry so far, social has been a lot about quantity and less about quality. So it's been about you know sharing things on Facebook and just broadcasting rather than the more intimate sharing. So one thing we want to do now is really redefine social within fitness uh, and make it relevant within a, a, a smaller group. Okay. Yeah. That sounds really cool. I think that's it for, for the questions that I have. Do anybody from the audience have a couple of questions? Yeah, right. <laughs> Yeah, we, we're definitely going to integrate with the watch, yeah. Uh, how are we going to go on, going to compete? Yeah. Um, 
Well, we, we don't know yet exactly what that product is. I, I doubt that they're going to go f full stream into the user experience in the, in the way we have it. I mean, what, what I've seen so far is uh, functionality-wise very basic. Um, so I think, I think what, what those big mobile players are interested in is, is a lot about the data, not necessarily spending a lot of time on the user experience, which really is... Uh, uh, quite a task. <laughs> it's taken seven years now and we still have a very long list of things we want to do. Um, so I think it's, uh, in general, I think the whole wearable space is it's very interesting. The media are still a lot more uh, happy with it than the consumers, <laughs> or a lot more fond of it. Um, but it we, we don't know yet what's going to happen and we some of the recent product launches we have have, have been around wearables. So it's been uh, yeah. Garmin integration, integration with all of Samsung's new wearables, and uh, and we have Android Wear coming out next week. So, uh, so that is definitely a big important trend. Sorry, any more questions? Yeah. Uh, it's more personal questions. Ha question: How it happens? The transfer. You are a screw in a huge McKinsey organization, and like you have all the everything is planned. You know, you get your salary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, well, I think we just, well, I should only talk for myself, but I, I just felt that it was the right thing to do, and it, it, it seemed like a good idea, and we just really believed that we could make a difference. But it was a pretty big transition, you know, suddenly you don't stay at four or five star hotels, and you don't have anyone booking for you, you have to find out which train to take from that city you don't know at all, and you know, how much it costs. <laughs> So there was a huge, uh, a huge transition, and you end up spending a lot more time on practicalities, but it's also a lot more fulfilling, I find. Was there any time like it's, it's too much to um, of course, we've had many, many tough times, but uh, but none of them have been tough enough to consider uh, not doing it anymore. Uh, it's always been very focused on the next goal, and then it, it. I think for me, it's felt like climbing a mountain or something. And then when you get to the top, you're happy for a second, and then you realize that the bigger mountain is right, you know, right next there. You have to climb another one, and this one is much bigger. And it, it somehow that keeps happening. Uh, whenever you think you're almost at the top, there's a bigger mountain. It's just okay. Here we go again. So, uh, yeah, it, it's been quite natural. Good thing you're developing and uh, uh, fitness app, then I guess. <laughs> yeah, you're getting in shape. It was, it was uh, when we officially launched it, it was pretty early alpha version, I would say. And we didn't really do that much testing because I think we had 10 phones or something. So we just used it ourselves a lot. And then we, we got it out there. Um, and we got people in with such a slow pace that uh, that was a fine beta <laughs> testing in itself. Um, yeah. So what the point of time did you realize that this was sticking? That I I think that that took a while, um, but 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 typically when you users tried it the first time and they did a workout and they saw the data afterwards, that was and that still is the aha moment where you realize okay this is quite useful. This is like a free GPS watch uh, that can actually do a lot more than than the watch can. Um, so I think th just from that feedback we we were quite convinced that this could be a thing. Uh, I'm 
terms of how, how big uh, our numbers? Yeah. Um, yeah, so we have 26, 27 million uh, users now ac across the world. Our main markets are US, Spain, UK. Uh, we're also big in uh, France, Italy, Scandinavia. Um, those are the biggest ones. And we have a team here in Copenhagen of around 40. And then we have a couple of people in other countries as well. Yeah, that's uh, th that's the challenge now. How do we really uh, get to a point where we have true exponential growth? I think the main our main focus when it comes to that is to use our the current users more as ambassadors and have them recruit people. Um, we until this spring we've never really done any traditional advertising. Our entire marketing budget has been spent at uh, at that conference in Barcelona. <laughs> so. <laughs> Well, so we haven't really uh, we haven't done any paid user acquisition until very recently, and um, it's always been very much based on the virality. And I think we we're fortunate in the sense that for those users who who you really use us and who see very good results, for those uh, Endomondo become has been life changing in their view. So those users are super loyal and can recruit a lot of other people. Uh, and that's in that sense we we're quite lucky with the product. It's I can think of many products where you don't have that same loyalty, uh, but uh, but that has really been driving it. And we need to gear that now. And there are certainly there are many ways we can do from a product perspective to uh, to get that going. Are you afraid of the health of the tablet launch? No, I think we we've integrated with it um, like. I think most most apps in our space are going to be. It's going to be interesting to see where they want to take it. Uh, it would be unlike them to really go into having a you know really go into consumer software in 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 this space. But you never know. So we'll stay tuned. Yeah, um, I'm not sure they were very technical. It was more like a, an observation that uh, the phone was starting to be not only your phone and something you use to text, but also your clock and your alarm in the morning and your camera. And we were like, well, you know, at already at that time, a GPS chip was quite cheap. So it we just thought it would be natural to, to make that common in, in the phones. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but it's very difficult because sometimes, you know, if you have a startup and you have technology that's too early, it's mm. quite dying in the process. Yeah. And, uh, and so it's, it's a very fine, fine edge that they're having the timing right, I think. Um, but you were certainly just convinced this is the way it's going to go. Yeah, I th and I think it was probably more God feel than anything else, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah. Um, when when you say th when you talk about the equity, do you mean uh, how we split it between us? Or? Yeah. yeah well it was just an equal split. Yeah. And then uh, initially we b since we didn't have any money and we uh, we didn't have anybody on the founding team with any type of technical skills, uh, we had to uh, we partnered up with a company who then got a, a share. Um, but then later on we figured we we realized that we needed people in house. So we split out again, and then we got investors on board and, and started paying salaries. Uh, and then the other question you had? Uh, there was, yeah, more like fundraising. Yeah, yeah but uh, we, we had a really easy time, coming from McKinsey, we had a really easy time uh, getting the meetings with the VCs. 
and we had a really nice PowerPoint presentation. They all uh, they all applauded that <laughs> presentation, <laughs> but unfortunately, it didn't get them to bring out their wallets. So um, so we we got some friends and and people we knew uh, to invest, like micro investors. They typically invested uh, around a hundred k or something Danish. Um, and then later on, we got professional business angels, and then the VC. Okay, so we got a, a two more questions, I think, something like that, and let's uh, round it off. All the way in the back. Well, we've we've also we've always uh, differentiated ourselves by uh, by focusing more on the social dimension, and also by supporting a lot of different types of sports. And the Mondo is not just a running app, even though it is the most used sport. It is a it is a fitness app for all types of dist distance based sports. Uh, and then I think the design and function uh, usability has always been a focus too. We have this quite Scandinavian uh, uh, design that we uh, that we like. Uh, we we did actually initiate a hardware project at at one point, but we uh, we decided against it before it even launched, and I I could not be happier. <laughs> that's uh, that's another space uh, I would like to to go get into. That is uh, very busy already. Why? Oh, because it's too busy. Or well, it's busy. You have low margins, and it's uh, huge investments, and. Uh, I mean, we right now I think we get approached weekly by someone producing a a watch or a fitness uh, step tracker or something like that, and uh, I'm <laughs> perfectly happy not being in that in that game. Final question, great one. Um, so we, I think the 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 three of us had different situations. Uh, but myself, growing up on the west coast, I had some savings. <laughs> uh, others had to borrow more. Um, but I mean, w one I think one important learning was that if you don't have any money, you don't really need a lot of money. Uh, most of what you spend your money on, you don't actually need. <laughs> it's uh, so. Plus, you suddenly realize that with the tax system, even if you make a little bit, you uh, or when you make just a little bit, you get most of it out. Um, so, uh, yeah, we just we had to either use our savings or, or borrow the money. Okay, thank you so much, Mette Lugge, for, for for joining us here today, and uh, you'll you'll stick for for a few minutes, I know. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you so thank much, Mette Lugge. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Now, uh, now we're going to go for yeah about a one hour, fifty minutes, something like that, for more beers and networking and real people like. Great, enjoy.